from Wilmington, give him a round of applause. And then over here on our right, we've got John. Is that right? All right, John. Uh, so give it up for give it up for John. How many people wish that they knew the answers to some really hard questions that you get from people who are not Christians? Yes, you wish you had them. You kind of like coming to youth group, but you're a little bit uh, fuzzy on some of the tough questions and you just choose to ignore them or whatever, whatever the case may be. Okay, tonight, hopefully, um, you know, we, we can kind of open your mind to a couple different things uh, through our little debate that we're going to have here tonight. We are taping this. Um, just a couple guidelines, guys. Please just turn off your cell phones, put them under your chair. Go ahead, seriously, get your cell phone out. I'm dead serious. Get your cell phone out. Turn it off on vibrate. If you turn on vibrate, put it away where you're not, it's not going to make any noise or anything. All right? We need everyone's full attention. These guys have driven a long way and uh, have prepared specifically for tonight. So please give them your full attention. Um, I'm going to be the kind of the moderator. Um, we've got some, some uh, questions picked out that they're going to go through. Uh, Caitlin, we have paper that we can hand out to these guys right now. Yeah, Caitlin's going to hand out some note cards to you guys, all right? As you're listening, please, if, you have, if a question comes to mind that either someone's asked you in school or you have a question for these guys and want to see them duke it out, um, please, please, please write it down and um, just kind of look at Caitlin and she will get them from you uh, and do your best not to make, be a distraction when you do that. Does everybody understand? No. Yes? Okay. All right. So We also don't have enough pens, so please share. <laughs> yeah. look, look for a pen. Look for a pen in your row. Okay. Without further ado, Pastor Kevin and John. How are you doing? Good. Good. Let me ask you, um, I'm just going to say a word, and if you know what it means or if you're familiar with it, I just would like you to raise your hand, please. Uh, evolution. All right. Charles Darwin. Okay. DNA. Pretty good stuff. Okay. Um, how many of you have heard about um, just uh, the way that we have evolved? Um, you've heard about evolution as far as the process in which we came uh, so far as primates uh, from apes. How many of you heard that? Excellent. Great. Um, are any of you currently learning about that in school? I know it's summer, but before you got out, have any of you this past year? Several of you. Excellent. Um, let me ask you this: Have any of you at your short, or excuse me, at your school rather, uh, been asked certain questions or, or told certain uh, facts that contradicted what you learned in church? Almost all. Of them. Have any of you ever left the classroom questioning what you believe? Now I'm asking for honesty. See, the first ones were easy. Okay. How many of you uh, have an atheist friend at school? All right. How many of you have ever been uh, jumped by an atheist? A few of you. We're not all like that. Okay. Excellent. Well, the reason that we're here tonight is I'm going to be um, debating for atheists. I'm going to be giving um, an atheistic worldview. I would like you to uh, have an open mind about some things tonight. I know that you come here and uh, learn about God and you carry a book and, and read a lot of things in that, but I'm going to be challenging uh, Kevin here, uh, who's been gracious enough to um, submit himself to this torment, um, and I'm going to be challenging him and I'm going to be challenging you on a lot of things. Uh, one thing that I would ask, um, I just want, want to give a little background. I didn't grow up in church, so I do want to ask that you would uh, please be honest, uh, that if you do have questions, that you would write them down and he don't be afraid. And also, you don't have to sign your name to them. I'm not going to hold them up and tell your pastor over here, Hey, uh, Pastor Joe, this one, this one's on the fence. I'm not going to embarrass you like that. So, uh, and neither will Kevin, right, Pastor Kevin? All right. Excellent. So, that's a little bit about myself. You're going to be hearing a little bit more of my remarks. 
Um, I want to be uh, challenging your minds tonight, and I hope that when you leave here, you have a better understanding about what it is that you believe, and make sure that you should be believing what you believe, and uh, Kevin's going to be doing the exact opposite. All right? Well, so I'm Kevin, by the way, and are you doing your introduction? Yeah, go right ahead. How are you? Thanks, John. So, I have a, my background is mechanical engineering, my bachelor's degree, master's degree, um, is aeronautical engineering. I studied at the Air Force Institute of Technology. I currently work at Wright Patterson Air Force Base, Air Force Research Laboratory. Now, does that by itself qualify me on everything? No, but I do have a scientific background. I have a background in observational science. How many of you have heard of the difference between observational science and historical science? Just a few of you. Right. For those of you that don't know, because this is going to be really critically important for us to understand what's going to happen tonight in these discussions. Observational science are things that we can observe in the present using the five senses. It's by observational science that we build airplanes, space shuttles, how your cell phones were designed and built, etc. What I do every day is observational science. Historical science is studying things of the past. We look at evidence in the present, and we have to interpret that evidence to determine what events took place in the past. The issue with historical science is that, because the past is the past, we can never test our conclusions. And historical science is always governed by our worldview. See, atheists and biblical creationist scientists, they have the same evidence. They look at the same rock layers. They look at the same fossils. They look at the same stars in space. They have the same evidence. What's different is the starting points. Atheists start with the presupposition of millions of years and of no God and no supernatural processes. Not just atheists, but many other, many other worldviews start with those types of assumptions. Millions of years, evolution, etc. Where creationists start with the presupposition that the Bible is true. We look at the rock layers, the stars, the fossils through a biblical lens. And that's the huge difference tonight. So as you hear this debate, what, you're gonna, what I want you to think about is through which worldview, uh, which interpretations based on which worldview make the most sense. Excellent. So what we're going to do at this point is I'm going to be asking a few questions uh, that I'd like you to answer. Uh, sure. And, and I would like for you to consider... Um, uh, yourselves, uh, you know, I was listening to you, you go on about the observational versus historical sciences. Uh, it seems pretty interesting, but let me ask you this: um, You're telling me that you believe that this planet is is uh, is a few thousand versus a few billion years old, this, uh, up to a billion. You're telling me that that the dinosaurs and all these things, this is just a few thousand years old. That's what you're that's what you're saying. I am saying okay. Um, so, let me ask you this, and um, I, I've, I've read your Bible, and I'm wondering, um, I don't see anywhere in there where it talks about dinosaurs, um, the fossils. Now, what's interesting to me is I figured that, you know, if, now, now let, me, let me back up. Now, do you believe that the earth was literally created in six days, and, and that you believe in literal time frames? Yes, I do. Okay, all right, so you, you believe, I feel like I have you on the stand now. Yep. Okay. Excellent. Where were you last night? You put me in. <laughs> All right. So you're telling me that that uh, according to your Bible, that it was a literal six days, seventh day, God rested, right? Um, so basically, this God that's up there, uh, he spoke. He spoke, and something happened. Right. Okay. And then when he spoke, and this happened. Um, you're telling me that this happened in six literal days, and then, right now, this now now give me a timeline. We're talking what six thousand years ago, right? About six thousand. Okay, years. six thousand years ago, and so from six thousand years ago until now, um, there were dinosaurs with man, even though the Bible never bothers to mention dinosaurs, and then um, they were buried, and um, they aged so so much so that. Um, a lot of our data tells us that there are, uh, some of them are, are 100 million years old. But you're telling me um, that you have, a, you know, you have evidence that supports that 
uh, these are in fact just a few thousand years old, and that is perhaps true that the dinosaurs coexisted with biblical creatures uh, and, and biblical uh, individuals. Uh, such a, a question for you would be, um, you know, I've read, I've read the story it of Sounds Hank. like you're asking a lot of questions. I do. Now, now let, let, let me finish it with okay. this. Um, David, um, you know, he's this king. How many of you guys know who David is? I've heard of David. Okay. And when I say David, you would automatically say... Ah, there's some sharp individuals. Okay, so David and Goliath, right? So um, basically throughout the entire Old Testament, um, the uh, God always uses people to do these major things, right? Um, let me ask you this then. Uh, do you believe that dinosaurs were around during when David was around? There's no, it's hard to say if they were around necessarily at that time. We don't know which dinosaurs and exactly when they went extinct from a biblical worldview. But let me answer a lot of the other things that you just mentioned. I want to correct something that you said. You said the Bible doesn't refer to dinosaurs. Right. Now, I would disagree with that presupposition for several reasons. God created all the land animals on day six. So that would include dinosaurs. Now, do we see the word dinosaur in the Bible? No. Why don't we see the word dinosaur in the Bible? Because the word dinosaur was not invented until about the 1840s. Now, think about when the King James Bible was translated. Uh, 1600s, right? Somewhere around there. Now, with that being said, we do see references to some interesting creatures in the Bible. Sometimes, some translations even refer to them as dragons. How about Job chapter 40, verse 15? The, you ever read about the behemoth? The behemoth has a tail like a cedar. God describes it as one of the, as like basically the largest land animal. And when you read the description, it sounds a lot like a sauropod dinosaur. So, I believe during the time of Job, there's evidence that dinosaurs did, in fact, live alongside man. I'm going to come back to dinosaurs, but I want to address a couple things. So, it may seem absurd that to believe that the Earth and the universe is only 6,000 years old because of what our culture says. Now, whenever somebody says to me, this many million years ago this happened, this many billion years ago this happened, and what I like to ask them is, were you there to observe it? <laughs> Who was here uh, living five million years ago? Anybody? No. Anybody witness the Big Bang? Anybody witness? Um, you know, a comment. Hit the may, may interrupt. Has anybody witnessed God speaking and creating something out of nothingness? Okay, let's just make sure. Now, with that being said, with the um, with the radiometric dating, this is what a lot of it is based off of, as far as the age of the Earth. Now, we're going to take the face value of a lot of these radiometric dates. You know, some of them do say millions of years. If you look at uh, strontium to rubidium or potassium to ar argon or uranium to lead. But if you take the face value of carbon-14 dating of a lot of things, for example, carbon-14 in diamonds, you get an age of the Earth that's only thousands of years. It doesn't make sense that carbon-14 would be in diamonds. Definitely not in an atheistic worldview, in an evolutionary worldview. That makes sense in a biblical worldview. Or how about helium and zircon crystals? See, helium, the, the rate at which helium can leak out, it's the same type of clock, same type of thing as looking at, you know, uranium to lead, potassium to argon, strontium to rubidium, those types of things. That actually gives an age of the Earth of 6,000 years. So, if you take, if you just look at the face value of all of these things, you get a whole lot of different ages for the Earth. So creation scientists are digging a lot deeper and have found that a lot of the assumptions with radiometric dating are, well, flawed. See, radiometric dating, that's how it works. You have a parent element, such as uranium, it decays to lead. So you have the parent element, and uranium, the daughter element, lead. And there's a decay rate. Imagine an hourglass. The top of the hourglass, the bottom of the hourglass. The sand's going to drop at a certain rate. Now, evolutionists assume that at the time that the rock formed, the igneous rock, that, the, that they assume that there were no daughter elements present. They assume that the decay rate has always been the same. And yet, that's historical science, because you know what? Unless you're watching those rocks for those millions of years, how do you really know whether or not the decay rate ever changed throughout that time period? See, there is a lot of, there's a lot of assumptions that are being involved. And this is why we have to understand this whole concept of historical science and worldviews. 
Yeah. One minute. One minute on this question, guys. We got. We got to move on from time. Right. Now, one thing that I hope to touch on with further questions is one key thing to really understand from the biblical creationist perspective in regards to the rock layers and in regards to fossils is the biblical flood. See, imagine this. Let's put our biblical glasses on. If there was a global catastrophic flood that occurred about 4,500 years ago, what would you expect to see in the world today? Wouldn't you expect to see, um, let's say, trillions and trillions of dead things buried in the rock layers, with about 95% of them being marine creatures? That is exactly what we see in the fossil record. We'll talk more about this, but from a biblical worldview, the fossil record makes a lot of sense. There's a lot of things about the fossil record that don't make sense in the evolutionary worldview. I hope to touch on that. I'm probably out of time. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, hey guys, you know, we've got a bunch of kids here and and stupid people like me who don't know don't know the science. What about what about things along the lines of suffering and some of these big questions that you, I mean, you know, Kevin, as as Christians, the big things that that are really challenging us in our faith. So the problem of suffering. Yeah. It's interesting you should bring that up, um, and I'm kind of glad that you did touch on that. Uh, <clears throat> how many of you guys, uh, and uh, if you're in here and you are a Christian, raise your hand. Excellent. Okay, all of you. Um, how many of you have ever been asked, why do bad things happen to good people? Okay. How many of you think you have an extra uh, awesome answer to that question? How many of you would be willing to share that right now? Okay. You believe you have, a, you have an extra, extraordinary answer to that question. Okay. All right. Uh, what's your name? Blake. Blake. Yeah. Blake, would you stand up and, and just uh, tell me? I'm going to ask you, why do bad things happen to good people? And I, want, I would like for you to tell me, why do bad things happen to good people? Well, in Scripture, it says bad things happen to good people. That way they can grow from it in God's perspective. And where's that at in Scripture? Uh, somewhere in John. I'm not sure the exact spot. Okay, so you're telling me that if I read the book of John, that's going to tell me that bad things happen to good people so they grow? Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. What's your name? My name is Joshua Winter. Joshua Winter? Yes. Are you a physics major? No. Um, go ahead and stand up. All right, Josh. Why? Why do bad things happen to good people? Well, it says in the Bible, for all have fallen under the sin. And if all have sinned, no one is good. So bad things can't happen to good people for no one's good. So you're telling me that nobody is, nobody is good. Nobody is good. Before we put him on a chair uh, and carry him out here, which I would love to do, um, let me ask you a question then. So, you're telling me that nobody is good. Okay. So, nobody in this room is good. Okay. So, then, um, if nobody is good, then why do atheists like myself go out and feed the starving? So, you're telling me that I'm not good? Yes, I'm telling okay. you you're not good. <laughs> You like saying that, don't you? <laughs> Forget your chair. Okay. So you're telling me that I'm not good, that no matter what things that I do, I'm not good. That's what you're telling me. It's kind of insulting, don't you think? Yeah. A little bit. I mean, you know, I'm sitting up here and I'm, I'm taking time to do this. Me being here tonight, isn't that good? Is that good? Not, good. Not, yet. not yet. Not yet. It's good, but you still have sin. I still have sin. But that's not what I'm asking you. I'm asking you, can I be good? Is there any good in me at all? I don't know. No? Okay. All right. All right. Hey, I appreciate your, your, your effort. Good. Kevin, go ahead. Well, okay. you know, have you ever told a lie in your life? Uh, what is a lie exactly? Uh, are, you, are you telling me, have I ever told a half-truth? That's still alive. Absolutely true. All right, what do, call, what do you call someone who lies? I call that person a uh, smart or a lawyer. A liar. Have you ever stolen anything in your life, no matter how small? A gummy bear. All right, what do you call someone who steals? A lawyer. A 
feet. <laughs> Have you ever committed adultery? No. Okay, let me define that for you. Have you ever looked at a woman with lust that you were never married to? Yes. Alright, Jesus says you commit adultery in your heart if you do that. Okay. So, let, let me just ask you this. What does that have to do with me doing good things or having good things? Just emphasizing the fact that you're not good. Not good by God's standards. Okay, so you have all this sin in your life, right? You're a self-admitting liar, thief, and adulterer, and probably a lot of other things if I go through the, through the Ten Commandments. But, let me go back to the ultimate, one of the ultimate answers that I give in response to why do bad things happen to good people? Why do bad things happen in this world in the first place? See, evolutionary worldview has kind of almost pulled the rug out from under us when we're not actually not looking to the beginning of the Bible and what it says. Think about Adam and Eve. When God created, everything was very good. Everything was very good. There was no sin. There was no death. There was no suffering. There was no decay. The second law of thermodynamics probably wasn't even in place. That's probably what the curse is. See, after Adam and Eve sinned, the curse comes in, which might in fact be the second law of thermodynamics, which says that everything decays, everything dies. So, we have all these bad things that happen, nobody's good. Now, the answer that you gave, uh, there's some validity to that in the sense that God doesn't waste anything. Yeah, bad things happen, God can use bad things to grow us, but that's not the ultimate reason why bad things happen. The ultimate reason why bad things happen is because of our sin. Okay. Straight from the beginning. So, so you're saying that the reason that we're not good is, is our own fault? Right. Okay, so the reason that all bad things happen is our own fault? Yeah. Interesting. Alright, back in the back. Somebody else had your hand up for an answer to that. What's your name? My name's Noah. Noah. I'm his older brother. Okay, are you going to beat me up? No. Okay, great. No. Alright, Noah. Alright, why do bad things happen to, to good people? Um, well, what Josh just said was absolutely 100% correct, is that we are all bad people. And you asked him, um, or you said, like, that, that seems a little offensive. And he was like, well, yeah. And like, yeah, like, from a surface point of view, that does seem offensive. But if you think about it, the entire world is bad. Nobody is good. Nobody is kind of good. Nobody is really, really bad. We're all just bad. We're all on the same level. Okay, so why would that be insulting if we are just, all of us are bad. He's not greater than you, and, and Kevin here, he's not greater than you either. We're all bad. Therefore, like, I don't find it insulting to know that I'm awful on a daily basis. Okay. And, well, okay, well, partially because I don't like to base my standards on the efforts of others. In other words, if everybody in my class received an F on an exam, I'm not going to walk away if I got an F and said everybody got one. I have an issue with that. So I would rather think that everybody's inherently good and say that there are some bad people than to say that everybody's inherently bad, like what's been explained, and that there are some good people. And, and you're good if, uh, if you're in church, but if you're not, um, then you're, you're not. Uh, or, or that everybody's bad, even in church. Uh, but the difference is, uh, what is the difference then? I mean. Uh, and and I, would, I would like to continue this dialogue briefly and, and hear what is the difference between you and I? If you if if in your and I and I don't agree that everybody's bad, you do. So then, what what's the point? If everybody's bad, hold on, please. I, I want to hear his response on this. So I just want to make sure you're asking me. What I think you're asking me is that what's the difference between you and I? If like like my like what's the difference for me for me being bad and you being bad? Me believing I'm going to heaven and me believing you're going to hell. Okay. Is what you're asking. So there you have it. I'm going to hell. Is that, is that what you're asking me? Uh, uh, that's not quite. Well, I'm glad that you said that. But what I'm asking you is that what's the difference? If we're all bad, then what's the point of trying? What? Why do we? Why do we have an instinct okay. nature to be good? Um, well, I believe that we have an instinct nature to be bad. Um, it says that over and over in the Bible. Um, uh, uh, we're at. I couldn't tell you. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm not well read. I'm trying to be. Okay. Uh, but it says over and over in the Bible that we're inher inherently evil. Okay. And um, honestly, <laughs> the difference is I don't know what you're asking me. I'm, I'm going to be completely honest. Well, you I said we are all idea. bad, right? Yeah. We're all bad. We're yeah. equally bad. Yeah. What? Where? 
Where's hope if we're oh, all okay. bad? Okay, what you. makes, what's the difference? The difference is, the hope is what Jesus did for us on the cross, uh, when he died for us, and that is, that is the saving grace, that is the hope, that is the reason we're alive, is to tell people, listen, like, we're all inherently evil. Jesus died on the cross for us to take that inherently evilness away, to change our hearts and to change us within. And it's not a physical thing that you can see on somebody more than a smile on their face and a, and a true hope in their eyes. But it's, a, it's an internal, completely internal change. Okay. okay. And I, so tell me more about, wait, wait, I'm, I'm interested about this. Yeah. You're saying that there's a change on the inside that's intangible, you can't touch it. Exactly. Can you go just so briefly, but summarize exactly what happens? Uh, I mean, is it like a Transformers movie, or...? Um, I'll, I'll share my experience. Um, I was addicted to drugs for a very long time, okay. throughout my high school career. And um, a friend of mine came to church one night and spoke, and um, really convicted me, and I just had a lot of eternal thoughts and a lot of eternal babbling. This is fun, but this, but what he's talking about seems greater than something that I could construe in my head. And so I talked to him after sir, or during the altar call and asked him. I was like, "Dude, like, what's going on inside of like, what is this like talking? You know, that's going on inside of me." And he he laid hands on me. And he said, "Well, let's pray about it." And he prayed for me. And it was it was like in the Bible, Paul, Saul, he's walking through the woods, right? Then all of a sudden, scales come over his eyes. He can't see anything. He's completely blind at that point. All right? So he's walking, and, and somebody, I think, if, if I'm not mistaken, I don't know the story perfectly, so he prays for him. He has a God moment, and the scales come off of his eyes, and that is the perfect, that is the perfect explanation. Is like, I was blind, but now I see. It's a whole new light on thing. And okay. then that, that's the eternal um, change in your okay. heart. Okay, and what's your name? No. All right, Noah. Thanks, man. Thanks, Noah. Now, John, I want to put you on the hot seat. You put us on the hot seat, ask some very good questions. Sure. And I appreciate that. Now, you use a lot of biblical presuppositions that you seem to believe in. You actually seem to believe in a concept of using the def using the word good and the word bad. Well, I was kind of led into that. Uh, but you seem to be believe in it. Now, the thing is, is how could good and bad, how could you even define those things in an atheistic worldview? See, we have an ultimate standard. God defines what's good and bad. In an atheistic worldview, it doesn't make sense for there to be any standard of what's good or what's bad, even if you say it's relative. Relative implies that there's a direction upward and a direction downward. See, if we're all just a bunch of random chemical processes, like, let's say, like, you and I are just baking soda right now in an atheistic worldview. So why does it, why would this good and bad and things like that matter? Why not just survive all the fittest? Why not just kill each other? That's a good question. Uh, I believe that uh, people are inherently good. Uh, and good not based on a biblical perspective, but good meaning that uh, I know a lot of Buddhists that are good. I know a lot of Hindus that are good. I know a lot of Muslims that are good. So, to say that it's a biblical presupposition. Wait, I'm going to stop you right there. So you're... Uh, okay, let me. Okay, go ahead with your biblical okay. presupposition. So, so if you were to tell me that everything is based on biblical presupposition, then you would have to. I would have to actually believe in the Bible, uh, because I learn a lot about good and evil from elsewhere other than just the Bible. So, while you're saying this could be good and evil or a biblical presupposition, I would challenge you to say that's a Quran presupposition. See, the thing about the Bible is. You, even though you might believe that their presuppositions borrow from somewhere else, you have to ask, where did those other beliefs borrow those presuppositions from? In a biblical worldview, God started everything from the beginning. He defined good and evil. So even in those other beliefs, even in those other religions, when they talk about good and bad, when they talk about what's right and wrong, they're borrowing biblical presuppositions because we have... We have a, uh, a whistleblower. God tells us in the book of Romans that everybody has that sense. In an atheistic worldview, that doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense to have the concept of good and bad. You just used it. You said that you believe that Buddhists are good, and you're using that. So you do believe in this concept of good and bad and what's right and wrong. That suggests that you have a standard. 
you, you must have a standard of what's right and wrong. Sure but even the concept of right and wrong is something that's a biblical presupposition. In an atheistic worldview, there is no ultimate standard of right and wrong. It doesn't have to be. Yeah, I've got to tra transition us here. We're running real low on time. Um, but we've got a great question if you guys are up from yes, it for, from, our, from our group here. All right, I don't know who wrote this, um, but here's the question. If God gave us free will, but He knows what's going to happen, uh, you know, how does that work? If God is giving us free will as humans, but yet He knows it's going to happen, does that mean that He's making it happen, or does He really give us free will? How does that work? So this is, this is the, the whole issue of predestination. God is omniscient. He knows what's going to happen in the future. And he knows... He knows who's going to be saved. Now, I still believe in the concept of free will and that sin is our fault because that's what God's Word says. So if we're going to base this off of what the Bible says about God knowing what's going to happen, we're also going to have to trust what the Bible says about, you know, that it's still our fault. So we can't t twist the logic and say, well, since God knows, knew, knew what's going to happen, that must mean it's God's fault. Well, if that whole idea of God being omniscient and knowing the future is based on the Bible, well, let's look at what the Bible says says about you know sin and, and death and hell. The Bible makes it pretty clear it's still our fault. Now, God may know what happens in the future, but Scripture makes it pretty clear that God still seems to, you know, He almost allows Himself to be surprised in a way. He still reacts to our sin. He still... He still reacts when somebody is redeemed. The angels in heaven sing. The angels in heaven celebrate when somebody is redeemed. So we can criticize and question God for his omniscience of knowing what's going to happen in the future because he is sovereign. But we know that God is holy. He is righteous. He is just. We are sinners. But we know that God is full of love and mercy. And he provided a way for salvation through Jesus Christ. So you're, so you're saying they work together. They, they, they ultimately do. work together. Work. All right. Taylor's the one that asked the question. She has something she wants to add to it. Um, so, like, what I was wondering was, like, something that I've always struggled with as a Christian was why, like, I understand that it, it's your fault and that you have the choice to accept salvation or not, but knowing that somebody, like, you put somebody on her that was going to go to hell anyway. Like, I don't understand why he would. He gave us free will in that choice, but I don't know. It just seems like a waste of a life. You know, if that that person didn't exist in the first place, I've heard a lot of atheists complain about this. You know, it's interesting that usually I hear this from atheists, like, "Well, if God placed me here." and I'm going to go to hell, then why did he create me in the first place? Well, you know, what's really interesting is if they weren't created in the first place, they wouldn't be able to say that in the first place anyway. So it's kind of a logical circle. At the same time, when somebody, you know, complains about that, they usually know the way to salvation, and yet they still choose not to take that way of salvation. Okay. Um, the, the question that, that's being asked, making sure that I understand this, is, uh, why does a God make people if he knows what's going to happen to them eventually anyway? So in other words, why does he make somebody he knows is going to go to hell? Is that right? Is that what you're saying? Um, well, uh, you know, honestly, it's more of a question for you. Um, because you're, you're asking the question under the impression that there is God. And that, uh, according to the Bible, that that's what happens, right? Um, I would say that, uh, you know... For me, it's kind of a hard question to answer because I'm going to have to answer it based on the way you would answer it. Um, but uh, if if uh, if God existed and and He made people and they were inherently bad and they died and they went to a place called hell, um, you know that's a that's a tough thing to remedy. Uh, you know because um, you know it it's hard to it makes sense of it by just saying that it's a logical circle. I mean. Um, how does that how does that line up? And and, and I heard that it was it, they work together, um, but uh, you know what if what if you're not born into the Christian faith? Well, here's I want to declare I disagree. Try to finish this one up in two minutes, guys. We got one more after this. Right. There's a presupposition that hell is the ultimate problem. 
God makes it clear that sin is the problem. When people are killing each other, when people are cheating on their spouses, and when, when you have human sex trafficking and all these horrible things that happen in the world, if God wasn't just and didn't have that ultimate punishment, what kind of God would we be worshiping? We have a God who is just, and at the time of judgment, He's going to make things right. See, hell is a solution for the punishment that people deserve. It's just like when a criminal gets you know, in trouble, say, a murderer. They're going to get sent to prison for their murder, right? Now, they might complain and say, well, you know, this law is stupid. I don't want to go to prison, you know. That's the problem. No, the problem was this crime. The punishment was a solution to that crime. See, that's what makes, that, that's one of the aspects of God that is worthy of our worship. Because He is holy, He is righteous, and He is just. And He will judge everybody and give everybody according to what they deserve. Later. Now, absolutely. And God, as the scripture says, God lets the wheat and the weeds grow together so that many will come to be saved. And remember, scripture clearly says it is God's desire for all people to be saved. Even though it may not be what happens, it's still His desire. There's that sovereign will and there's that perfect will. Now, can I put John on the spot with a couple questions? Moderator, oh, okay. thanks. Because um, we're running out of time. I've been burning to ask you these questions. Here is a huge problem with evolution when it comes to observational science. There is no known observable process by which an organism can add new genetic information and become something more complex. And there has never been an instance of life coming coming from non-life. So, John, I'd like to I'd like for you to try to give me an example of evolution that we don't have to rely on faith where it's not just speciation within a created kind, but where we have one kind turning into another kind. And what I, what I mean by kind is the boundary of creatures that can still breed with one another, such as the cat kind, or the dog kind, dingoes, foxes, wolves, they can still mate with one another because they're part of the dog kind. So John, I have a question. Can you name an instance, Can you, are there any observable examples of evolution today? Uh, if you're talking about a dramatic jump from one species to another, no, there isn't. But it doesn't mean that there's not ever been. It just means that we haven't found it yet. Uh, so it sounds like you have a lot of faith. Uh, you call it faith. I call it research. I, I believe that as, if, as we continue to research and we look for one to find the answers, it doesn't mean that we have all the answers now, nor do you. Uh, but eventually, I believe that we will. So... Here's, here's the thing. Evolutionists, right, they believe in evolution because, probably because of the fossil record. Is that what their evidence is based on? Well, sure. All right. I so mean, that, have, you, have you seen these? Have you, have you seen? I've seen museums. a lot of fossils. Have you gone to the museums? Have you? Yeah, I have. And, see, from a biblical perspective. based on what you've seen, you're telling me that you don't believe in evolution. Right. It takes a lot of faith to believe in evolution. We see, we see, what well, we see in the fossil record, uh, we, we see, for example, actually some fossils that aren't totally fossilized. Uh, now this goes back to the whole age of the earth issue. Take a look at this picture. You know what this picture is? Blood vessels, soft tissue of dinosaurs. There are many examples of this. Now in an evolutionary worldview, which takes millions and millions and millions of years, supposedly, here I'll let you take a look at it, Millions and billions of years for creatures to evolve over time by these random processes. Uh, you would expect that you wouldn't expect, you know, soft tissue to last that long. Now, another thing about the fossil record is that 95% of it is sea creatures, and we see sea creatures on top of the highest mountains. We see sea creature fossils on top of the Himalayas. Now, how in the world could they possibly get up there? It doesn't make sense for sea creature fossils to get that high. And it's not from, it can't be from mountains just being pushed into place because of the, because of the sea creatures. Is it, let me ask you, assuming that there was a flood, you know, uh -huh. that what, even if the earth was flooded, how does that give credibility to the entire Bible? It gives credibility to looking at the fossil record from a biblical worldview. Okay, so you're saying that through a biblical worldview that fossils make sense. 
And that makes sense because it's impossible for these fossils to have any of the traces that they have, soft tissue and things of that nature, uh, it would be impossible for that to have lasted through millions of years. Right. Okay. And that the way that they ended up on top of mountains was through a flood. Right. Okay. All right, guys. Well, last question from from our group, and it kind of you know leading into the Bible itself. If if God was real, where's the proof? You say the Bible is proof, but it was written by man. It could be a made-up thing to give people something to believe in. This will be probably our last question. Okay. I'd say the ultimate proof of the Bible being true is that anytime anybody tries to argue against the Bible, now. I, uh, actually, before I even get into that, those of you who have experienced redemption and salvation through the Holy Spirit, that's enough proof already. But to answer the critics, anytime somebody tries to argue against the Bible, they have to borrow biblical presuppositions to do it. Whether it is right and wrong, whether it is justice, whether it is, for example, laws of logic. Laws of logic make sense in a biblical worldview because we have a lawgiver. That doesn't, that doesn't really make sense in the atheistic worldview. 1 plus 1 equal 2, that makes sense in a biblical worldview. 1 plus 1 equal 3, that makes sense in an atheistic worldview. How about the laws of physics? Evolutionists, atheists, very heavily depend on the laws of physics. That is basically their God. They have a lot of faith in that. So do we. We also believe in the laws of physics. Then how do you explain miracles? Lot, oh, that is a great question. Now, let me finish what I'm saying about the laws of physics. See, we have a lawgiver. It makes sense that we have laws of physics that stay constant. Because if I were to punch this table, right, or this well, podium thing, whatever you call it, the electrons in my hand are going to oppose the electrons of this podium. That's going to be pretty consistent, right? Because we have a lawgiver. But in an atheistic worldview, why not just my hand just go straight through? Now, as far as miracles, we have a God who is in control of all of these laws. He is above these laws. He put them in place. So God can do whatever He wants. He spoke the laws into existence. He can change them temporarily to make a miracle happen. So if God is the one who put the laws in place. It's not the laws that are above God. It is God who put the laws in place. He is above those laws in a sense because He instituted them. All right, so that's the last question then. Um, closing remarks? Yeah, I'd like to make some uh, closing remarks. Uh, first of all, I want you guys to know that I'm a devout Christian. Uh, I'm actually the youth pastor. So, how many of you guys saw that coming? I wanted to fight you. Yeah. <laughs> Noah, Noah's out there. He's about where he whacked me inside the head. It's like he's an atheist anyway. Tell me if hell's not real then. Um, but the reason that we did this is I want you I want you to be aware of this. The reason of this whole thing. Kevin, you've done an awesome job, by the way. Uh, yeah, give it up. Uh, the reason that we did any of this is because when you get out of high school, you're going to go to college, and you're going to have people a lot more, as much, and even more arrogant than I was, and asking you a lot of these questions. Now, I would like to touch on a couple of things. First of all, Taylor, right? Taylor, Taylor's like, oh no, <laughs> Taylor. Um, and, and I love the answer, but I would like to say something, okay? Uh, as far as if God knows, then why, right? Um, I think I think one of the best ways to answer that is to ask you this: uh, Do you ever plan on falling in love? Do you know that? <laughs> She's like, I am. He's really awesome. His name's Justin. No, I'm kidding. All right. So you plan on falling in love, right? Right? Do you understand that people have a have a, a, cap a capacity to hurt you, to break your heart? Do you understand that divorce rates are 51 percent? Okay. Do you understand that a lot of times when you love somebody, they are not going to show you that love in return? You understand that? And yet you're telling me that you're still willing to fall in love. Interesting. I guess what you're ultimately trying to tell me is that if the person doesn't have an option to get out of it, then it's not love at all. So in other words, if I force you to love me, it's not real love, is it? Love has to be an option. God created us for that very purpose. He knew that we could let him down and that we would walk away from him, but he didn't want robots. He would have created them. We have some outside in the cars. But the reason that he made us the way that he made us is because he wanted us to choose him. Because that's what love is, and the Bible tells us that God is love. Right? right. So doesn't that make a little bit more sense? Now, how about this? How about this? How about 
you have a child, you understand that in having a child that there's going to be a chance that they're going to reject you. And yet, will you still love that child even if they reject you? But you already knew before having them that there was a chance they would reject you. So is that going to stop you from having kids? No further questions. Great question. Uh, the, the other question was about, uh, what was the other one? I just want to touch on this real quick, because you came one of the best, dude, you're much smarter, the scientific stuff. What was the other question? Oh, proof of the Bible being true. Oh, proof of the Bible being true, yeah. Uh, that's an excellent question. If God, God used man, right, to write this Bible. Uh, and, and, and so, in other words, the, the question is great. Now, let me ask you something. Uh, do you have the glasses right there? What's your name? Trevor. Trevor, I want you to, to tell me this. If, if you started writing a novel, okay, and I never got a copy of the novel, all right, and I want to talk about right now. You started writing a novel. I never got a copy of the novel. What do you think are the odds are that I'm going to list your characters and then I'm also going to agree with everything that you have already said before me when I never even got to read what you wrote. What do you think the odds are that I can continue your novel and make sense? One in a million. Trevor, you are a mathematician, my friend. That is even more than that. But you know what? We're not in the dark on this either. Because fortunately for us, some Ivy League schools, even though a lot of them are full with atheists, decided to do a study. And I want to tell you what the results they got. They found out that in order for the Old Testament prophecies of Christ to have been fulfilled the way that they are, that mathematically, and if you want to go and you want to look at the numbers, please do. You can look this up online and research this stuff yourself. But they found out mathematically, they gave us a parallel so that small minds like me can understand it. Okay? And here's the parallel. They said, this are, these are the odds that the things written in the Old Testament would have actually been fulfilled the way that they were by Christ. The odds are that you would have had to take four feet of silver dollars, stack them four feet high, side by side, across the entire state of Texas. You would grab one, put a mark on one of them, stir the entire state of Texas, blindfold somebody, walk them over the border of Texas, and if they pick the one up on their first try that you put a mark on, that, those are the same odds as Christ fulfilling one of the prophecies the way that he did. Mathematically speaking. Amen. Now, how many of you guys think that's pretty impressive? That's pretty impressive. Let me tell you something else, because there are a lot of other religions out there, and I was pressing that point. How many of you guys know that there's other religions? And there's also a lot of counterfeit money out there, but there's only one real currency. You have to understand this, that just because there are duplicates of something doesn't make it real. One time when I was in Gatlinburg, I bought CK1 cologne from a guy selling it out of the back of his car. It smelled like garbage. And then I read in very tiny print at the bottom, our version of CK1. Well, they missed it. So what you're talking about with presuppositions is very, very true. Now, I challenge you on that because I said that other religions have that. But... Biblical Christianity is the true currency and we've made copies of it. Y'all, every time you go into a store and you give them a 50, I don't care how real the 50 looks, they mark it and then they look at it. Alright? It's like CSI. They're like looking at it, making sure that it's not counterfeit. That's how close you can get. You can get so close that it can it can, it can fool the naked eye. But if you look at another growing religion such as Islam, you understand that their prophet actually studied the Old Testament. Then you have an idea of the presuppositions that he had when he wrote the Quran. Not to mention that the word love isn't found in the Quran. And personally, that offends me because I think love is what this life is all about. And, and apparently so does God. So, uh, uh, and also, you said that you know, God keeps it interesting. How many of you guys have ever seen a movie and then you went back and watched it? Why? If you already know what's going to happen, right? You go and you watch it because it connects with you, right? And so sometimes, here's what I believe when it comes to God. I believe that God knows a lot of stuff that's going to happen. But at the same time, God never stops drawing us to himself. And in the blink of an eye, things can change. The books can be rewritten. And that's what's so powerful about God, is that he has that ability. Your answer about the physics was perfect, by the way. That, the physics are, that's awesome. So, um, I hope, I just want to touch on that. But you ask yourself, and you think about that, okay? God is in control of all this stuff, but at the same time, you have to understand that you are going to be in situations in high school and in college where you're going to have people that are going to basically mock you the way that I was for believing in God. 
And you have to know exactly what you're going to say. You're going to have to have an answer for that. So here's what I want to encourage you guys. Just some feedback for you. Noah. And Blake. Yeah. yeah. Joshua. I remembered it. Excellent. First of all, your story is awesome. Your testimony is great. As an atheist, I wouldn't believe you, though. Um, I will encourage all of you. I want to challenge all of you to study your Bible. And I'm not just saying read it. Read it and then study it. Read it and then study, okay? And what I mean by this is every time I go eat a meal, I don't look at what all ingredients are in it, I just eat. But then if I'm cooking, I look at all the ingredients. When you go to an atheist, you need to know the ingredients. So in other words, you gotta say, okay, an ax. You know, an ax, and, and then give me your references, okay? You said somewhere in John. You gotta give me your references, okay? And you know what? You guys were doing a good job. Your explanations were there. But as an atheist, if I can tell you everything that I believe in, why? Should you be able to tell me? Isn't that what Paul told Timothy? To study and show yourself and prove? Isn't that, aren't we supposed to be able to give a reason for the hope that we have? And let me encourage you all with this. Okay? Because I have faced many, many atheists. And I continue to do so. And I love them. I want to commend you for the way that you guys didn't attack me. Okay? Now, I was insulted because you told me that I was bad. But Josh, you're right. Why? Because we know in the book of Matthew, when Jesus was approached, and they said, good teacher, he said, why do you call me good? There's only one good, and that's God. That's a great answer, right? But as an atheist, all I'm saying is you're calling me an idiot. You're calling me bad, right? But it was a great answer. But know your stuff. Know your references and be able to break down. You were doing so good. I got a little cocky with you, and you started getting a little shaky. Let me tell you, you're going to have some professors who talk with a British accent, which already makes them sound smarter. <laughs> And they're going to look down at you over their pot belly, and they're going to be 70 years old, and they're going to make you feel so stupid for believing what you believe. But if you know your word, and you know why you believe what you believe, you are going to drive them crazy the entire year. Trust me. And not only that, but you're going to probably convert other people in your class. So don't allow body language to provoke you to violence. Don't allow it. Don't get mad at them. Okay? No, don't beat me up in the parking lot. All right? You're going to feel like it. I feel like it sometimes. But the thing is, is that you need to, we have to understand why we believe what we believe in order to reach a world that is going towards science and believing, by the way, that science and God cannot mix, which is ridiculous. Because just a little known fact for you, science came from Christianity. Right. Something never to forget. You're not going to learn that in your classroom, but do your research. Okay? That is something never to forget. All right? So, thank you for your time. Pastor Joe. Yeah. yeah, you guys asked some really great questions. Here's the thing. These are questions, good questions to ask because they're all the same questions that I have. Now, I feel like my faith is rock solid. My roots have grown deep because I have asked questions and gotten the answers. A lot of these questions, who was Cain's wife? You know, what about distant starlight? All these things. If anybody asks me those questions, I feel no hesitation, no problem giving good answers, good biblical creation science answers to those questions. And what I encourage you when asking those questions, check out a website called AnswersInGenesis.org. That's a creation science ministry. They have hundreds of PhD scientists that work for them, and they have all kinds of resources and books, like this book that goes into great detail about the flood, called the Global Flood. I'm almost done with it. They even have like little pocket guides and things. I brought these in case I needed to look something up real quick, whether it's you know a young earth, you want to learn about radiometric dating and how it actually supports a young earth, you got that. How did all the animals spit on the ark? How could they have been taken care of? Uh, how about, you know, ape man? How about evolution and supposedly humans evolving, evolving from apes? This book utterly demolishes that concept, embarrasses it quite a bit. Or, you know, dinosaurs, things like that. <laughs> I'll tell you what, when you start to learn this stuff, you start to see just how utterly, profoundly ridiculous evolution, the evolutionary ideas are. And they are not based on any real science. They're not based on any observational science whatsoever. Just because somebody can ask a question doesn't mean that they have the answer. All right? And just because they ask you a question that you don't know does not mean that they're right because of the question. All right? Does that make sense to you? So just because somebody can say something that you don't know on the spot doesn't mean all of a sudden they have support behind what they're saying. Ultimately, atheists have to explain 
how exactly something came from nothing. And they also have to explain the emotions that we have and why we care so much about people and why we have a desire and we're born for a desire for a creator if there was not one. I can be in this building and even though I didn't see anybody build this building, I know that somebody built this building. I don't believe that two masses of gas happened and then this building hit because that would just be way too cool because it has a pool table. Let me apply the theory of evolution to building a computer. I'm just waiting for one to pop out of the ground right now. That's If I were to apply the theory of evolution to build a computer, and then I would wait for one to just sprout up, right? I'm going to be waiting forever. It's not going to happen. Our DNA, everything about us, intelligent design. That intelligent design is not some lofty god. It's the god of the Bible. Very good stuff. If you close your hand, there's nothing in it. Keep it closed for 10 million years. Open it and tell me if something's there. Nothing but ashes. You won't have a hand anymore. True question. Thank you for your time, Pastor Jeff. Hey guys, give these guys a round of applause. The one and only point I want to make, in addition to what these guys said tonight, who is the ultimate opponent of of God and of Christians? Satan. Satan. Who, who, is our, who is our ultimate hero against? That opponent, God. God. Je Jesus Christ, right? Jesus Christ. And what what did Jesus? You know, we're faced against atheists all the time as Christians. When Jesus was faced with the devil coming at him with with everything in the desert after after not eating or drinking for forty days and forty nights, what did he go to? What did he know? He knew this. He knew his sword. And we talked about this on Sunday. This is your offensive weapon. You know, so many times when I talk to atheists, I'm playing defense all the time, and I'm trying to come up with something. And But if I know this, if I've got my sword on hand, that is my offensive weapon. And guys, do not... Every every week I get on you guys about, about bringing your Bibles, all right? If there's one thing you can do to be ready for battle, it's to have your sword. Thank you guys so much for coming. Thank you so much. All right, guys. You, you are free. We're gonna, if my group can put all the chairs away, we're going to hang out, play air hockey, get some music pumping, play pool, go outside, play some basketball.